Shall we bow our heads together? Our gracious, loving Father, we look forward to that day when we will see you. But we also ask that each and every day you would help us to see Jesus. In the words that are spoken this morning and everything that is done, that Jesus would be lifted up, that we would behold him, and we would be changed to be more and more like him, is our prayer in his name. Amen. Have you ever felt abandoned? I'm guessing to a greater or lesser degree, we've all experienced some of that feeling. Maybe we wouldn't, you know, call it abandoned. That sounds a little big, but felt alone or felt by ourselves. Different ways. Maybe you felt it by family. I'm guessing probably all of you remember a movie that came out a long time ago called Home Alone. A child that was forgotten. Probably abandoned would not be the right word, but whatever you want to use. You know, we remember, and of course it was very humorous, but the truth is it's not a humorous, it's not funny. Maybe you felt it by friends. You know, a tendency sometimes with children, as was mentioned in our children's story, to get caught up in that where somebody is left out. Maybe it's by your church family. It's sad to say, but sometimes it happens. Maybe, if we're honest, we felt that we've been abandoned by God. We felt like God has turned his back on us. Have you ever been abandoned? Literally, emotionally, different ways that we may have experienced it, that we may have felt that way. Just curious, Hansen's disease, have you heard of it? See a few hands. Do you know what it is? See a few hands, very few, that know what it is. Well, let me use a different term that you're probably more familiar with. Do you recognize that term? Leprosy. The current term, the term, medical term, is Hansen's disease. But leprosy, we've heard of it. Now, I don't know if I should dare try to pronounce this name of this Hawaiian, you know, island and spot. Kalu, Pop, anyway, I won't, I won't just, uh, there's no point in me, you know, you know, disrespecting the name. But it is one of the remote areas in Hawaii, and it has been a leper colony. There are still some people, some who still live there, but it was where people were exiled up until the 1960s. For I don't know how many years, many, many years because of the fear, because of different reasons. Now, times have changed, but there are people that still choose to live there. And as I was reading online, that basically as long as they choose to live there, they will be allowed. When basically all of them pass away, then there will be some changes done and discussions as to what should be done. But times have changed. Today it is a disease, I'm told, that can be treated. Medicine, antibiotics, different things, it can be treated, it can be cured. But that's not the way it was, especially not in ancient times, not in Bible times. It was not curable. It was contagious. It was greatly feared. There was nothing probably that you could have said worse to you in that day than you have leprosy. I don't know what we'd compare it to because cancer really doesn't fit because you don't have to abandon me because I have cancer. We could talk about Alzheimer's and that's a pretty scary thought. And I may not remember who you are, but I'm not contagious. It requires you to be abandoned by your family, by your friends, by your church in that time, the synagogue, the temple, you were not allowed to participate in any religious service. You really had one choice. You could live with fellow lepers, or I guess you could live by yourself. It's hard to imagine what it must have felt like. I don't, like I say, I can't think of anything we could probably relate it to. There's probably something. But that stigma that would come with it 
not only of society, but to also feel that you had been cursed by God. That not only does nobody else want to be around you, but God himself doesn't want anything to do with you. That was the perception. That was the way it was viewed. Our story in Luke chapter 5, starting with verse 12. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man was what? Now, you know, I'm guessing that would be somebody that was pretty advanced in it, not somebody that was just starting out. A man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Simple story. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Here is this leper, and he hears about Jesus. He hears about some of the things going on, and you kind of wonder, how did he hear? Because, you know, he's not supposed to talk to anybody that's connected with society. There was no social media. He couldn't check on Facebook or his smartphone or even a newspaper or anything else. And yet he heard. You know, folks, I'm thankful for all the technology and things we have. But apparently, you know, the gospel, the good news could travel even without all those things, even to people that nobody talked to. Maybe we need to realize it's not so much us and our technology as it is the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. But he hears. And I can just imagine he begins to have a little bit of hope. It's kind of, you know, that, that you're, well, maybe, but, you know. I mean, yes, Jesus is different, and he's healed people, but, I mean, I'm a leper. You know, I'm not like anybody else. But there is that hope that begins to spring in his heart. And he begins to search for Jesus. And I wonder, how did he go about that? You know, you can't go up to somebody and say, do you know where Jesus is? Well, you could, but they're going to throw rocks at you. They're probably not going to answer you. If they do, they're going to tell you Jesus doesn't want anything to do with He begins to search for Jesus, and he finds Jesus. You know, I think the truth is, if we're honest, it's not so much he found Jesus, but Jesus found him. You know, the Bible says, when I search with all my heart, God knows a sincere heart, and there is no sincere heart that is looking for Jesus that will not find him, because God is already looking for you. And he knows where you are, and he knows how to bring you into his presence. Lord, if you are willing. I mean, why would he say, if you're willing? What had he been taught all his life about leprosy? You're an outcast. You're unwelcome. You're not a part of society. You're not a part of the religious system. You can't have anything to do with anybody other than fellow lepers. It was viewed in that day, this is a curse from God. You're obviously a horrible sinner, a terrible person. That's the reason this has happened to you. So just, you know, don't come near anybody. Don't have anything to do with anyone. I wonder... Do we misrepresent God's character? Maybe to the people who need to know the truth more than anyone else. Those who are on the fringes. Those who are on the edges. Those who are excluded. And do we let them think, yeah, that's the way God wants it. That's the reason you're actually there because God doesn't have any interest in you. Do we misrepresent his character, his love, his grace? 
maybe knowingly, maybe unknowingly, do we send a message that God really doesn't love you? God, in fact, doesn't love you, but he doesn't like you. He hates you. He's abandoned you. He's punishing you. That's the reason you have this disease. You know, do you remember when there was this new disease that came out called AIDS? And there were Christians who made comments about why certain people were getting that disease. And it had nothing to do with God and how God operates. It had to do with, sadly, our Christian prejudice and bias. I would remind you who is responsible for sin, for suffering, for disease, for death, for all the problems we have in our world today. It is not God punishing sinners. It is a result of sin. Do we ever teach people God doesn't love them by our indifference? By having, if we're really honest, you know, in the church, we have acceptable sins and we have unacceptable sins. Now, there's nowhere that I know of online where you can go and get the official list. But, you know, if you've been in the church for a while, you know it's true. It's not just the church. It's everywhere. You know, in society, there are acceptable sins. There are acceptable things that, you know, well, we know they're not really, but, you know, they're okay. And there are those that aren't. Now, what that list is depends on your, you know, religious background, your political background, your, you know, a lot of different backgrounds. But we have our lists, what's acceptable and what isn't. You know, if I was to say in the church, I might say there are some things in the church like pride, as long as we're humble about it. You know, as long as we tell people how the Lord has blessed us. But it's really not about the Lord's blessing, but about look at what I've got and what I've done, and, you know, maybe it's gossip. Well, you know, I'm just sharing a story that I heard. Well, no, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's really helpful. Maybe it's criticism. You know, we're real good at pointing our fingers at people. We're real good at knowing what other people ought to do. Maybe we need to just look in the mirror a little more often and have that talk with the person that's looking back at us. Seems like I remember something in the commandments about bearing false witness. And we share stories. We retweet. We forward emails. We call on the phone, we text, and we share things. Maybe it's even true. It's just not helpful, it's not redemptive, it's just not Christ-like. You see, we have some acceptable sins in the church, if we're honest. And then we have unacceptable sins. You know, I don't know if I dare go here, but I'm going to. You know, we can talk about some easy things depending on which political party you're in. You know, that other party, they're not acceptable in some of their philosophy. But maybe if we get a little closer to home, there's a community out there that probably most of us are not very comfortable with. It goes by some initials, LGTB. And I understand some of the things that make us uncomfortable. And I understand the theology and what is biblical and what is not. But you know, I also understand that the Bible is very clear. If I hate anybody, if I do not love even my enemies, God calls that a sin. And God doesn't say this sin is acceptable and this sin is unacceptable. You see, the truth is there are no acceptable sins. All sin is terminal. All sin ends in death. Whether it's accepted by the church or whether it's not accepted by the church is really not the issue. The issue is, does God say it's okay or does God say it's not? That is the only standard. You see, there are no, unex no acceptable sins. 
But I'd ask you a different question. Are there any unforgivable sins? It's kind of a trick question. Is there any sin God will not forgive? I would say no, there's not any sin God will not forgive. There are sins God cannot forgive because I will not repent. The issue is not God's willingness, the issue is me. God is always willing to forgive. The Bible is very clear, if I what? Confess my sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive. The issue is not on God, it's on me. Now, yes, there are things God does not, cannot forgive, but it's because I won't repent, because I will not confess, because I continue to justify my own behavior, whatever it may be. But the Bible is very clear. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, the problem is we need to learn to love sinners the way Jesus loves sinners, and we need to learn to hate sin the way Jesus hates sin. I've asked the question before, but I'll ask it again. Is there anything you can do to make Jesus love you more? I don't know of anything. Is there anything you can do to make Jesus love you less? No. Well, then it doesn't matter what I do, right? Well, I guess as with any good lie, there's a little bit of truth to that. From God's perspective, it will not change how much he loves me. It will not change the fact that he died for me. What it will change is my relationship with him. You see, I can accept his love. I can be changed by his love. I can share his love or I can reject it. I can reject his love, his forgiveness, his grace. But it is interesting, you know, in the gospel, Jesus is accused of a lot of things, and sometimes there's a little bit of truth to it. One, he's accused of being a friend of sinners. Luke chapter 7, verse 34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, the truth is, Jesus was not a glutton, he was not a drunkard. However, he was a friend of sinners, wasn't he? You know, the simple truth is there was nobody here on planet Earth for him to be friends with but sinners. And I'm glad he was a friend of sinners because if he wasn't, then I don't have any hope and you don't either. I'm thankful that he is a friend of sinners. What's hard for us is it's hard for us to believe it's possible to be a friend of sinners and not sin with them. And maybe for some of us in some circumstances, it's not possible. But by the grace of God, I can be friends with people who do things I don't agree with without participating in sinful behavior. But the only way that will happen is to have the one person who can make it possible living out his life in me. My friends, I wonder, are we looking for lost people to introduce to Jesus? I saw this and... It just kind of spoke to me. Maybe it will to you. Maybe it won't. Jesus spent his whole life engaging the people most of us have spent our whole lives trying to avoid. I wonder how true that is of us as Christians. I wonder how true it is of us as Seventh-day Adventists. Maybe there's part of the reason that we're still here and we haven't finished the Gospel Commission that we haven't shared the ever-loving, everlasting gospel because we're trying to avoid certain people that God doesn't want us to avoid. God wants us to share his love and his grace with. I am willing. You see, the truth is Jesus is always willing. He's willing to heal. He's willing to forgive. He's willing to save. And God is always willing and always answers our prayers. He doesn't always answer them the way we want him to. He doesn't always answer them when we want him to. Sometimes God's answer is immediate. When it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to salvation, God's answer is immediate. I think of Peter there, you know, as he was walking on water, and you know the story, he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. What was Peter's prayer? 
Lord, save me. And the next words of Scripture are immediately, Jesus was there. When it comes to my forgiveness, when it comes to my salvation, Jesus' answer is always immediately. But there are sometimes it is in his time. It is on his schedule. Psalms tells us to wait on the Lord. That's not something we're good at as a society, is it? You know, we're not good at waiting. You know, just sit at a green light for a few seconds. You know, when it turns green, see how people handle waiting. We're impatient, and I understand it, but it's a real problem when it comes to spiritual things, and I allow my impatience with God to hurt my relationship with Him. Luke chapter 5, verse 13 says, Then He put His hand and touched Him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left Him. You know, again, all I can do is imagine, and I know I can't come close. But what it might have been like for that man. You know, some you sense is, I understand it, maybe I'm wrong, but leprosy, you know, what it does is it affects the nerves, and you lose feeling, you lose sensation. Now, I guess it's nice in one sense you don't feel the pain, but it's pretty easy to hurt yourself when you have no reaction to pain. But all of a sudden, those limbs, those body parts, that skin that was messed up, that looked hideous and disgusting, all of that changes in a moment. I can't help but think of another moment. Paul talks about in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. Immediately, the leprosy left him forever gone. Jesus touched him. I wonder how long had it been since he had been touched. Since he had had a kind, loving touch, a kind, loving word, anything positive sent in his direction. Has Jesus touched your life? Are you touching other lives for Jesus? That is what we're called to do. There is the touch of Jesus. That which is appropriate, that which is loving, that which is healing, that is rich, is redemptive. You know, and I don't really like the thought of saying it, but the sad truth is there's some other touches. That which is not appropriate, that which is not consensual, that which is not loving, which is not healing, which is not redemptive. You know, we've probably heard enough of it that I don't need to go into any more details. There's that kind of touch. There is non-consensual touch that is never appropriate. But if we're honest, there is some consensual touching that goes on that is morally inappropriate. Even though we may like it, it may feel, or whatever, it is still wrong. Jesus' touch is always healing. It is always in harmony with Scripture. Immediately, the leprosy left him. If I confess my sins, forgiveness is immediate. The cleansing, the sanctification, that's the work of a lifetime. But when I confess my sins, he is faithful and just, and I am forgiven immediately. If I cry out to the Lord asking him to save me, I have been saved. Doesn't mean there's no growth. Doesn't mean there's not other things for me to deal with in my life. I may feel the transformation. I may feel a change. I may not feel anything. But I must believe what God says. Regardless of whether I feel forgiven, whether I feel saved, my faith must stand on the Word of God. And God says, if I confess my sin, He is faithful and just to forgive. Well, I don't feel forgiven. 
well, I'm sorry and I can be sympathetic, but I would remind you, forgiveness is not based on how I feel. It's based on doing what God asks, confessing my sins and believing that God is faithful and just. You may not be, I may not be, but God is. And if God says he has forgiven you, then you have been forgiven. Regardless of how you feel or what your opinion or somebody else's opinion may or may not be. And he charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses had commanded. Jesus charged, it's very simple, tell no one. Show yourself to the priests. Offer the sacrifice for your cleansing that Moses required in the law and do it as a testimony to them. Four simple thoughts that we're going to look at very quickly. Tell no one. Well, why wouldn't you want to share the good news? I mean, isn't that what we're all about as Christians? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all in favor of sharing the good news. We need to do that. But there was a reason Jesus told him not to tell anybody. There were some issues going on that this man, being an outcast from the site, he didn't understand. He didn't know how much people hated Jesus. Now, my friends, I want to say this the right way. I believe we need to be looking for opportunities to share God's grace anywhere we can. But there are places in this world that hate Christianity. And I'm not saying we don't share the gospel. I'm saying we have to be careful how we do it. We can do it in a way that actually works, or we can do it in a way that makes it much harder. We need to be careful how we share the good news. We need to make sure that we do it in the right way, in the best way possible. There was a desire to destroy Jesus, to get rid of him. But my friends, there was also Jesus' desire to reach the priests, the leaders of his people. And he knew if the news got there before the man did, it might affect the judgment that he would be given. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 45. Same story, just a little different. Now a leopard came to him, employing him, kneeling down to him and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion. I wonder when we see pain and suffering how often that is true about us. Stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could what? No longer openly enter the city, but was outside in the deserted places. And they came to find him in every direction. Now, you know, in some ways, well, that sounds like a good problem to have. But, you know, God's plans know no haste or delay. The devil's just as happy to hurry up the process of destroying Jesus as he is to delay it. Whatever misrepresents God's plan. In the book Desire of Ages, interesting little comment. But his act in blazing abroad, the matter resulted in hindering the Savior's work. It caused people to flock to him in such multitudes that he was forced for a time to cease his labors. Now, again, this goes to the hatred, the prejudice. If things happen too quickly or too slowly, God has a schedule. Everything was on time. Good intentions, my friends, are never a reason for not following Jesus' instructions. Well, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. Folks, let me tell you, there's a lot of things God's going to tell you that aren't going to make sense to you. To put it in a simple context, how many times did you make sense or not make sense to your two-year-old or your five-year-old? You know, sometimes 
we're just not at a point where we can understand. I have to believe and I have to trust God. God has a reason for all He does and He asks us to do. Should we be excited about what Jesus has done for us? Absolutely. Should we want to share what Jesus has done for us? Yes, we should. And the truth is, most of us don't have this problem. Most of us don't talk too much when it comes to sharing Christ. But it is possible that we can do it in a way that hinders instead of helping God's work. And the devil doesn't care whether I say nothing or whether I say the wrong thing the wrong way as long as it doesn't lead people to Jesus. I need to make sure the Holy Spirit is leading in all that I do. Show yourself to the priests. Who was it that could say in that society whether or not you had leprosy? There was only one person. It was a priest. You had to go. He had to look, and there was a process. We're not going to go through that. But he had to pronounce you clean or unclean. He was the only one who could say you were clean. My friends, who alone can say that you are free from sin, that you are clean? That is Jesus. He is our high priest. And the only opinion that matters is Jesus. It is Jesus who pronounces us clean from sin. It is Jesus who pronounces us forgiven, saved, transformed, changed. There is the offer, the sacrifice for your cleansing. Jesus instructs him to follow the law of Moses. Because you see, let me put it simply, healing leads to obedience. Until I have been healed by God's grace, I can never really obey. Healing leads to obedience. Jesus followed the laws of Moses. Now, he didn't follow the traditions. He didn't follow the commandments of men. And that's what upset the leaders. Now, they said, you know, you're not following the laws of Moses. Jesus always followed the laws of Moses. He always followed his word because it was his instructions. What he didn't follow, what he didn't take so serious, were the commandments of men. And we need to be careful that we don't get those confused. And we could talk a lot, and we probably wouldn't agree on everything. But what we need to make sure of is it's the commandments of God that we're following and not the traditions of men as a testimony to them. Interesting little concept there. As a testimony to them? Well, now, wait a minute. They're the ones that pronounce What is the testimony to them? Very simple. It was a testimony of God's love. God's love for those people that society had said, you're not worth our time, our energy. You know, maybe somebody left a little food or something. But for the most part, they were forgotten. They were abandoned. My friends, there is no one God has forgotten or abandoned. There is no one God does not love. A testimony of respect for the law. Who was it that gave the law of Moses to Moses? It was Jesus. Jesus respects his law, and he asked us to respect his law. It was a testimony of his power to deliver from sin and death, not just literal death, but spiritual death. And it is also a testimony to us today. Did all accept the testimony? No. We'll all accept the testimony today when we share the good news, when we share God's grace, when we share... Will it? No. Sadly, many will not. But my friends, by the same token, there were hearts touched by that miracle at that time that bore fruit down the road. We do not know what seeds will germinate, what seeds will grow, and what will not. Our job is to spread God's word, to sow the seeds. The harvest is his. It's interesting in Desire of Ages, that same chapter just a little bit later. By many the light was rejected, yet it was not given in vain. Many hearts were moved that for a time made no sign. During the Savior's life, his mission seemed to call forth little response of love from the priests and teachers. But after his ascension, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts 6, verse 7. 
do you have leprosy? We could call it sin. We could call it pride. We could call it self-righteousness. We could call it a lot of things. But what is it in your life? What sin is there that is destroying your life, destroying your relationships, maybe with God, maybe with family, maybe with friends? My friends, I would ask you the simple question, do you want to be made whole? Well, I don't know if Jesus will accept me. Maybe you've heard some of the things that leper had. You know, God is not interested in your type. I mean, the reason that you have this is God is... No, my friends, there's a lot of bad theology out there about God. My friends, I don't know what's happened in your life, but I know Jesus loves you and he will accept you. Well, I don't know if he can forgive what I've done. My friends, I don't want to minimize sin, but there's one thing that's greater than our sins and that is the grace of God. Jesus' answer is the same today as it was to that leper, as it was to anyone that comes to him, I am willing. The question is not, is God willing? The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to come to Jesus? Are you willing to let him change your heart, your life? Are you willing to ask Jesus to make you whole? Today there's a medical cure for leprosy. But more importantly today there is a cure for the leprosy of sin. It's not new. It has always been the same. The cure is Jesus. It is his blood. It is his grace. It is his spirit. It is his forgiveness. The question is still very simple. Do you want to be made whole? Our gracious Father, the truth is we all have a leprosy. We all have a problem with sin. And there is only one that can heal us, and that is Jesus. Father, I would ask that you would help each one of us to come to you. Not to say if you are willing, but because we know you are willing. Because we know you love us. We ask you to cleanse us to make us whole. And Father, I would ask if there is anyone that has never accepted that grace, that in the quiet of this moment they would say, Lord, I want to accept your grace. I want to accept your forgiveness. I want to accept Jesus. I want to be a new person. I want to be born again. And again, Father, for those of us that have made that decision, may we be more and more faithful to you. May we be more and more true to you. May we be more and more like Jesus. May we be filled more and more with your grace is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand together?